Game one of the Houston Regional features these two longtime rivals, Texas and Texas A&M, back on the same field, meeting for the 378th time. Ryan Burke is the DH for A&M with Blake Alamon at first, and he fouls the first offering off. Right-hander Nathan Thornhill comes in at 6-2. and two. His ERA, 1.51. He also has a couple of saves to go with his 12 starts this season. Not a big strikeout guy. 49 Ks in 83 and two-thirds innings. And he's working from the stretch after a leadoff single by Blake Alamon. Double play depth for the Texas infield, and the second offering to Burke has popped up. Ben Johnson racing towards the line, and in foul territory has it for out number one. Let's take a look at the scouting report now for right-hander Nathan Thornhill. Yeah, not a real big guy. You see his fastball. It's going to be 88 to 91. His changeup is his best pitcher. He will throw it in any count, any situation. But the best thing about Nathan Thornhill is he throws strikes. He is a strike thrower. And away from home, he has been incredible. 2-0 with a point two three zero point two three earned run average in six starts away from uh, Austin. Early opportunity for Texas A&M with Cole Lankford at the plate. And a throw to first chases Alamon back to the bag. Texas A&M is not a team that's going to run a lot. But P, uh, Thornhill, pardon me, will keep an eye on Alamon as Langford waits for his first pitch. And it's popped out of play. This is a Texas defense, which is 10th in the nation after having turned 60 double plays during the course of the season. And they have a 975 fielding percentage. Top 30 in college baseball. You said it before, Ben, it, Texas team which is like many Texas teams good pitching good defense and a lot of small ball yeah enough offense but again that ballpark they play in is such a big ballpark you know you got to play to what what you have and that's why you see a lot of good pitching and defense and small ball West Coast ball whatever you want to call it Texas just manufactures runs you know last year at UCLA you could call it national championship ball <laughs> yeah I mean we may not ever see that again a team comes in batting 240 something and that's what UCLA was hitting last year entering into Omaha but you know we've talked about this before it's gonna be the team that gets hot and stays hot here in the next couple of weeks it'll win the whole thing and listen it's a bunch of teams out there that could do that right-hander Thornhill Ahead in the count, nothing and two to Langford. And it gets him swinging. First K for Thornhill. Well, Thornhill, this is his, what makes him so good. You see the catcher, Barrera, rocks to the outside corner, wants the ball out there, and Thornhill right to the glove, just a few inches off the outside corner. And that's what you could do. That's what pitching is. Pitching is all about changing speeds, of course. But when you get ahead in the count, like Thornhill was right there, it's about expanding the strike zone. And that's exactly what happened. Barrera rocks outside. The ball's delivered just a few inches off the outside corner. Leadoff man reached. That was Alamon. He's still at first with two down as Nick Banks comes to the plate. And once again, Thornhill staying close with Alamon over at first. He only has four stolen bases on the season in seven attempts. A real speed is the bottom of the lineup. Craig Bratson is their stolen base leader. Nick Banks is riding a seven-game hit streak. Yeah. He pops this one out of play to the left side. Yeah, Banks is just a freshman. But he's an all-SEC kind of guy. Really, really played well for A&M and sits right in the middle. Not too often you get a... A freshman that sits in the middle of your lineup in the four hole in the SEC, but Banks has certainly done that. 348 average. There goes the runner. Pitches low and in. It's a called strike and no throw from the catcher, Tres Barrera, who's caught 40% of base sealers in the season. <laughs> A really good jump by Alamon right there as he gets in the scoring position. Ball bobbled just enough by Barrero. He has no chance. Banks kind of shot a, a second look back to a home plate umpire. It's the eighth straight strike thrown by Nathan Thornhill. Ooh, that one just missed. One ball, two strikes. 
Uh, again, 0-2 count. He's ahead in the count, trying to expand it. The strike zone. Barrera rocked to the outside. And I mean, that ball. Sometimes you get that call. Lots of times, if you rock out there as a catcher and you set up two or three inches off the outside corner, the pitcher has the ability to hit it. Lots of times, you'll get that call. But not in that situation. And so the one-two. Miss low. Two balls, two strikes. And a very patient Texas A&M approach against Nathan Thornhill. He seems to be a deliberate worker on the mound. Well, you can see Texas A&M's approach already. They know how good the changeup is of Thornhill. So you see all the fastballs. Are, they're trying to hit him opposite field. They're trying to stay with him. That way, when he does get the changeup, they'll try to stay on him. And there's a changeup, the first one we've seen. And even though you have that approach with two strikes, that's how good Thornhill's changeup is. That ball was still hit right off the cap of the bat by Banks. Folks, wait till you see the changeup grip that Nathan Thornhill employs. Well, A&M certainly has the right approach because if you're going to go up there and jump at a fastball, as good as his changeup is, he'll make you look silly in a hurry. And Ahosa try to run in behind Alamon, who has his fifth stolen base on the season. Yeah, you try to keep that guy as close to second base as you can for the obvious reason. If there is a base hit, Sometimes one step or a half a step makes a difference in the outfielder being able to get the ball home for an out. And low and in on Banks to take the count full. Yep, that was one of the first breaking balls. So here's the last couple, you know, the sequence here, the last two or three pitches saw the first change up and now the first breaking ball by Thornhill. Wouldn't surprise me at all for a 3-2 change up right here. Got one of the best hitters up in banks. You got first base open for the three-two count. Wouldn't be a surprise at all to see a changeup. Grounded to the left side on the fastball. Hinojosa has it, and that will finish the frame. No threat from AM after the leadoff single and one stranded. AM nothing. Texas coming up. They are all over the place at Reckling Park for this rivalry renewed Texas A&M and Texas as we go to the bottom of the first inning. No score. A&M got the leadoff man on but stranded it. The Texas team has been much better away from home, especially offensively. They play a different brand, a brand of baseball when they get on the road. Mark Payton is batting in the three hole. He's got a Big 12 record 95 game on base streak going over the last couple of seasons. He's six in the nation in walks. Longest active streak in the country. And it's it's kind of backwards to see a guy like Peyton with a huge on base percentage hitting third. It's not necessarily a traditional Texas lineup. Yeah, you more of a sec two hole guy, you know, because he doesn't strike out that much either. And typically you'd like to see your two hole guy, you know, be the guy that doesn't strike out a whole lot. But it's just the opposite here in Texas. You know, they're struggled offensively, but as you mentioned, they are different away from home. Only a 266 team batting average, which quite honestly is just very average. But again, strengths are pitching and defense and enough offense. And they'll go with their ace right hand of Daniel Mangden makes his 16th start. He's 4-8 and eight on this season with an ERA just over 3.5. 94 strikeouts in 101 innings pitch. Here's a look at Mangden's scouting report. Yeah, certainly don't be fooled by his record 4-8. and eight. He's much better than that. See his fastball will be up to 93 miles an hour, sometimes harder. He has to command both sides of the plate with his fastball to be effective. But that slider is really, really good. And when he gets ahead, he's real good with that breaking ball. He'll start with Brooks Marlowe, who brings an eight-game hitting streak to the NCAA postseason. Texas back in the postseason after a couple of years being left out. Junior from Giddings, Texas. Mangdon's got a funky delivery, and his first pitch fastball is in for a strike. Nothing in one. Yeah, he's got a little bit of deception going on, especially with his glove. If you watch his glove, he's kind of up and flashes the glove and has a little bit of deception with that glove. Second offering is lace foul, nothing in two. See, the glove kind of goes up and whips away at the last second. Anything you can do to have a little deception always helps. And that's why his fastball, although it's very hard, it seems much harder when you face him because of the deception. He can be a big strikeout pitcher in his 0-2 offering. Missed away. He's reached double digits in strikeouts three times this season, including 11 strikeouts and just six innings worked in his season opener. Struck out 11 Razorbacks back on May 9th. 
And there's that big slider that he has. It's good. No, there's no doubt. I mean, he's second in the SEC, only behind LSU's Aaron Nola in strikeouts. So he's, he's right at a strikeout per inning. And when you can do that, you certainly have above average stuff. Yeah, second in the league in K's, and Nola is a first rounder in the future, and the pitch misses the way. Full count now after being ahead, nothing and two. Well, we've seen both pitchers trying to establish the outside part of the plate. Nobody really pitching in as of yet. Payoff to Marlowe is popped out of play. Magnin is also a workhorse for this Texas A&M team. If you're keeping score, you might as well pencil him in for seven or eight. <laughs> the kid wrote A&M stinks. Come on now. <laughs> the rivalry goes through all ages. Well, he but Mangdon has thrown over 100 pitches 12 times in 15 starts this season. Oh, make no mistake about him. He's a horse. I mean, he's out there for the duration, wants to be there the whole time. Quickly running out of territory down the left side is Jay Stadium, and that one finds some A&M faithful. And some they mouth for note, yeah, about Mangdon as well. You know, talking to Coach, he, of course, Childress, you know, says he's pitched through some injuries this year, and that's one reason why his numbers are a little bit higher than they were last year. Four and eight's deceiving. When you face everybody's ace on Friday nights, it's really, really tough. So he didn't get much run support. But he pitched through some tough times this year, but he's getting healthy again. This one's lifted deep to right field. Banks gives it a look, and it is gone. Leadoff home run for Brooks Marlowe. Eighth pitch of the at-bat, Marlowe got one to drive on a full count offering. Well, you can say what you want to say about how big Texas's ballpark is, but that ball would have been out of any ballpark. But that's what happens. You know, first batter of the game, 3-2. You got to throw a strike. You don't want to walk the leadoff guy and give Marlowe a lot of credit. He saw enough pitches and caught a fastball, milled the plate up, and didn't miss it. I'm talking about he melted this thing out into the trees out in right field. Now Ben Johnson at the plate and gets by the catcher Troy Stein. I mean, just the sound it came out. And Marlo knew when he gets that hop at the end. But watch this thing. It's way up in the trees. Texas up 1-0. And Ben Johnson is ahead in the count 2-0. I can't tell you as a pitcher, the first inning is the toughest inning by far. Us stars, you know, we, we want to get our feet wet. We want to get out there. And the bullpen mound is different than the game mound. You get the big adrenaline flow when you step into the game. And it's just, it's different, you know. And sometimes you just need something good to happen. There's not a brook to go in right here and just calm his big righty down a little bit. Just not sure what's going to work for you that day. I mean, sometimes you leave the bullpen saying, well, I got a good breaking ball. Then you can't find it in the first inning. Or maybe the fastball is outstanding. You get it, you don't have control of it. So it's always tough. And Mingan is a guy, if you're going to get him, you better get him early because once he gets his feet wet a little bit, he'll start finding that rhythm and getting it going. He finds a fastball over the inside corner for the first strike to Ben Johnson. His third baseman, Logan Nottebrook, came in to have a word with Mingan. Junior from right here in Houston out of Westside High School. Off the hands, and it takes a count full. Talk about some of the issues Mangdon has had to battle through. He had a back injury in the spring. Worked his way through that. Got to start against Arkansas in the SEC tournament on four days rest. Allowed a solo home run there. Chopper to short. Taylor on the run. Can't make the play. And making the turn is Ben Johnson on a wild throw. Johnson goes to second. On the throwing error from the shortstop, Logan Taylor, who was back in action after missing significant time with a dislocated kneecap that occurred first series of May. Yeah, Taylor has to go in the hole, throws it on the run. Pretty good job, but he gets away from that. I'm not sure he gets him anyway. I mean, Johnson got down the line really good. It could be an infield hit in the error. And that's a ruling from the official score. Single for Johnson. And already a visit from head coach Rob Childress. He's also their pitching coach. See Johnson getting down the line. That's what Texas has. A little bit of team speed, enough to put a lot of pressure on you. And that's what that is. Pressure on Taylor. And you mentioned Taylor's been out for a while. That's not an everyday, normal, average play he's got to make right there in the first inning. You know, this is the first game of this regional. And you'll hear a lot on the ESPN family of networks throughout the course of the weekend. We bring you every game. 
on a wide variety of networks. But, you know, the first game, especially with your ace, with a guy like Mingdon, is so important mm -hmm. when it sets up the pitching for the entire weekend. Absolutely. I mean, you want him to work deep. Win or lose the game, of course, you want to win it. You'd like to see Mingdon go out there and give you seven or eight. And that way it saves, you know, if you do happen to get the loser's bracket, it saves a lot of your bullpen guys that you're going to need at some point in time if you go deep into this tournament. So now he has to worry about Mark Payton and his tremendous run. His on-base streak sits at 95 games. That's a Big 12 record and dates the last season. You can extend that with a line drive single. Johnson around third. They're going to wave him home. The throw is late, and Texas leads 2 zip. So the error as of now costs A&M a run on Peyton's 36th RBI, first pitch swing. I'm talking about first pitch looking. Gets out in front of an off-speed pitch right there, but kept his hands back and was able to put the barrel on it right there and does just enough. Of course, we got a play at the plate. Banks comes in, makes a throw, but not in time again. Speed. Johnson Speed got him on first to begin with, and it gets him home as well. Here's Tress Barrera, the Longhorn catcher. He's hitting 273 on the season with five home runs. He's a great example of what Texas has been able to do away from home. Their road neutral numbers are incredible. And Barrera, no exception. 301 batting average, and four of his five home runs have come away from home. Ground ball to third, handled by Nottebrook to second for one. Alam on the turn, and AM is able to get the first two outs on a 5 4 3 double play, the 30th double play of the season. Well, Mingdon and Texas AM needed something good to happen right there, and of course, that's about the best thing that could happen for him. Already given up two runs, but gets an easy 5 to 4 to 3 double play. So if he can stop the bleeding right here, if you will, get his club, his offensive club, back into the dugout. A&M certainly not out of this thing. Here's Madison Carter. First pitch popped him up. Alamon points it out to Banks, and Banks will put it away. But not before Banks ran out of room trying to chase this two-strike pitch to Brooks Marlowe through the trees in Texas has opened the scoring here in Houston. It's 2-0 Longhorns. The NCAA Baseball Regionals is presented by the Quicksilver Card from Capital One. Earn 1.5% cash back on every purchase. And in part by GMC. Introducing the all-new 2014 GMC Sierra. Incredible thinking in the form of a truck. And Golden Corral. Help yourself to happiness. Welcome back to Reckling Park on the campus of Rice University where Texas and Texas A&M get us started. And the Longhorns get it started with a Brooks Marlowe home run. An error helps them to their second run. It's a 2-0 Texas lead. And Nathan Thornhill now has a lead to work with. They'll start with Logan Nottebrook. Nottebrook is a big power threat in this Texas A&M lineup. He looks at a first pitch curveball. Eight home runs in the season for Nottebrook of 31 hits that's a quarter of his hits that have left the yard yeah a little bit bigger than most third basemen you see him 6-3 and every bit of 225 junior college transfer from San Antonio originally went to Texas A&M Corpus Christi and then ended up at Temple College before coming to A&M I mean he's a I mean I saw him hit a homer earlier in the year he's a big guy Average isn't great at 263, but I tell you what, when he runs into one, when I tell you he can hit it a country mile, he can do it. Tom Hart with Ben McDonald, first game of the day. Rice and George Mason to follow. Donna Brooks, one of those guys who's had an up and down season, and it can be a long college season. Rob Childress was telling us, you know, first four or five weekends, he was fantastic. Then there was a little dip in play, and over the last month and a half, he's really turned it back on. Yeah. 
I mean, look, it, when you come from junior college, it's tough to adjust to the SEC in big-time college baseball. And while he got off to a great start, hit a lot of homers early for him, you know, he kind of, about the time he started to struggle, by the time they hit conference play. And it's different in conference play. But he kind of, you know, weathered the storm, if you will. And here as of late, the last three weeks, four weeks of the season, he's got his stroke going again. Yeah, he's hit safely in five out of his last six games. And look, looks at a fastball for a strike. Three and two. Yeah, he didn't like that. Thought that ball was off the plate or just low. But a good job of laying off of it. I mean, when you get in hitters counts, 2-0, 3-1, you know, you got to look for your pitch and your spot. And of course, that's a good take. Three balls and one strike, and Thornhill just paints the outside corner. Came inside on him, and he fouled it off. You know, and here's the difference, you know, and for Mingdon, behind a lot to the hitters in the first inning for Texas, and Texas made him pay for it. For the most part, Thornhill has been ahead in a couple of three, two counts, but he works ahead a lot, throws a lot of strikes, and anytime you can work ahead in the count, pitching is a lot easier. AM had a leadoff single from Blake Alamon, left him stranded, and there's a leadoff walk now to Nottabrook to start the second. And so Thornhill gathers himself. He's a senior from Cedar Park, Texas, out of Cedar Park High School. 13th start of the season. His opener, he started against Cal through eight shutout innings. He came out of the bullpen a couple of games against Stanford, Rice, and Houston, and moved back into the rotation after the first week of March. Yeah, and look, he's been really good, especially as of late, Thornhill. Hadn't given up an earned run in his last three starts. So he's been really good. And what's more impressive about him, he's not going to strike out. You mentioned it earlier, only 49 strikeouts in 83 innings, which, you know, is very average. But he doesn't get hit. Only opponent, opponents bat 198 off of Thornhill, which is outstanding. Second team All-Big 12 performer. Got away from the catcher, Barrera. Hustling to second is Nottabrook, and he takes a look back. He will stay there on the wild pitch. Just the fourth wild pitch of the season, uncorked by Thornhill. How is the postseason different for a starting pitcher? Well, I, for one thing, there's more energy. You know, you can say what you want to say. It's just another game. It's just this. It's just that. But I don't care. It's more of adrenaline flow, you know, and you get that. And so you got to be careful early in the ball game not to try to do too much not to try to overthrow as a pitcher not to do try to do anything that you haven't done to get you where you are to this point you know and I don't think Mingan tried to do that it's just the first innings are really tough and now Thornhill while he's a strike thrower you know this inning has struggled a little bit with his command so this is an opportunity for A&M they're already down by two runs but Stein's got to find a way to move that run to third base even if it's a ground ball to the right side then A&M's got to find a way to get him in he pops this one out of play, takes the count to two balls and a strike to Troy Stein, the A&M catcher. From Castroville, Texas, hitting 259 with runners in scoring position this season. Thornhill led the Big 12, only allowed a tick more than six hits per nine innings pitch this season. Ground ball to short. And Ahosa gets the runner back to second, and his low throw is helped by Clemens at first. One down. Yeah, that's Casey Clemens over at first base for Texas. One of four sons of Roger Clemens, who, of course, helped Texas win the 1983 national championship. That's a good pitch by Thornhill right there. Of course, if you're A&M and Stein trying to hit that ball to the right side to move the runner to the third base, but through a breaking ball, was able to get Stein to roll over it. And of course, once he rolled over to hit it to shortstop, no chance for Nottebrook to advance to third. Great to see Logan Taylor back on the diamond for Texas A&M. A painful injury against LSU, first series of May as he looks at a fastball high. Taylor dislocated his kneecap on a check swing. Childress says, I've never seen that happen before. They actually had to push it back into place at the plate in the middle of the game. Mm -hmm. But that felt good, huh? Gosh. That is a strange injury on a check swing. 
So he had been out since. He missed the Arkansas series, missed the Ole Miss series, missed some midweek games against Sam Houston State, and then they lost four to nothing against Arkansas in the first round of the SEC tournament. SEC sent 10 teams to the postseason this year. That is a record for a conference. Yeah, three times SEC sent nine, but this year set the all-time record at 10. That is more teams from the SEC in the postseason than the Big 12 even has teams. No, pretty impressive. I mean, it's just deep. You know, it's a deep conference. Obviously, when you get 10 in, and A&M was the 10th team. And as you mentioned, look who they beat. Beat National Seeds, Florida, and LSU in three-game series. Beat Vandy and Mississippi State. Unfortunately for Texas A&M, they stumbled against some teams they really should have beat. Yeah, like, they lost a series at Georgia. Right. And that's what they've done all year. That's kind of been the knock. They kind of played to their competition. They weren't able to elevate against teams that really they should have handled in one, two out of three. Not necessarily swept, because everybody's good in the SEC, but I'm talking about winning the, winning the series, winning two out of three. A little half swing and a roller up to first. Clemens has it and steps on the bag. It advances not a brook to third. Two down. Well, that was as good as a bunt. Well, you know, that's what Stein was trying to do, just something as simple as that to put that run at third base with less than two out. Then you hit another ball just like that, and you got your first run of the ball game. Unfortunately, now it's going to take a base hit to get the first run across for Texas A&M. So here's Jace Statham. He's really come on strong over the last 13 games. Senior from Orange, Texas at a Orange Field High School. He's hitting 324 over his last 13 games. He's raised his average 34 points. Swings at the first one. Gerwitz and Barrera chase, and it's onto the netting over home plate. Hey, the crowd is really filled in here at Reckling Park. We expect it to be at or near capacity throughout the course of the weekend, of course, with three schools so close here. Rice hosting. A&M just up the road. Texas the other way. Tickets went fast. Rice host George Mason in the nightcap. Gave him the strike low and in, and they count nothing and two to Jay Statham. Well, you see Nathan Thornhill starting to establish his fastball on both sides of the plate. We heard so much about the changeup. We've seen a few of them, but I tell you what he's done, which has been impressive to me, he's thrown more fastballs than anything to this point. You expect that to change, second trip through the lineup? Well, I mean, when you get a scouting report on a pitcher or a hitter, you always think that in the back of your mind. So I'm sure A&M was told, hey, he's got a great changeup. That's his best pitch. Go up there and look for the changeup or expect a lot of changeups. So Texas over there thinking, well, I know they're looking for my changeup. So, you know, what we're going to do the first time through. We're going to throw him a lot of fastballs. And that's what he's done and been very effective doing it. Came in on the hands. And it counts, stays a ball and two strikes. And, of course, you know, as a pitcher, the more you can pitch inside, if you do have a good changeup, the more you pitch inside with your fastball, the better it makes your changeup. Well, you say, why is that? Well, because when I pitch inside, it makes the hitter speed his bat up. He's got to really get it going to get to my fastball inside. So he's got to cheat a little bit. Then when I do throw my changeup off of it, my changeup's that much better. Missed upstairs. Might have been that changeup. 21st pitch of the inning for Thornhill. After that leadoff walk to Nottabrook. Nottabrook now 90 feet away from... Getting the Aggies on the board. Line drive up the middle, and Texas A&M has it on an RBI single from Jay Statham. Well, that's what A&M desperately needed right there was to put a run on the board. Even if it's just one run, just to go ahead and strike back and get some of that momentum back. Coach Childers talked about the balance in his lineup and the ability as of late to be able to hit top to bottom. And there's your 8-0 hitter. Statham right there comes up with a huge two-out <laughs> RBI single. It was a good at bat to him. He saw a lot of pitches. Finally got something he liked, fastball, middle of the plate. So now Statham at, uh, Statham at first with two down, and Cray Bratson to the plate. 
faked going, and the pitch is in for a strike. Nothing and one to Bratson. Craig Bratson is a local kid out of Bryan High School. Battled an illness early in the season. And with this plate appearance, and as soon as this game becomes official, he will have tied the school record in his 241st career game. Played high school ball with Ty Colbreth out of the Texas bullpen, and those guys exchanged texts as soon as this regional was announced. Kind of went two ways. Not only the excitement for A&M to face Texas, but just the excitement to be in as one of the last four teams selected. There goes the runner. Pitch is grounded to the right side and kicked by the base runner, and that will end the inning. Statham never got his eyes on the baseball. And so it'll be the bottom of the Texas lineup due up in the second. Statham looking the wrong way. Took it off the ankle. He's out of that ends the inning. Texas leads Texas A&M in front of a full house here at Breckling Park at Rice. We're in the bottom of the second. Corvallis Regional coming your way later tonight. Number one seed Oregon State against North Dakota State. Before that, they start with UNLV and UC Irvine. Talking with some of the A&M folks who went out to Corvallis last year, they said, you know, it was fun to be out on that trip, but it was a little bit different. I said, yeah, we had a couple of Oregon hippies watching the game halfway up the pine trees. <laughs> so A&M happy to be so much closer to home here in Houston. Actually, last year headed to Corvallis, they shared a charter flight with Rice, who was playing in the Eugene Regional, and Texas San Antonio. So what should have been a nice trip to the Pacific Northwest, where it is absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful, especially this time of year, Turned into a very awkward carpool situation. Here's C.J. Hinojosa. Popped up the first offering from Mangdon. Stein looking for room, and he runs out of space. Right behind home plate. Well, so important for Mangdon right here in this inning. One, he wants to have a short inning, obviously. Threw a lot of pitches in the first, and Texas got two on him. But more importantly than that at this point is his club has come back and got a little bit of that momentum back and cut the lead in half, two to one now. So... He needs to get his offense right back in the dugout as fast as he can. Needs a good one, two, three inning. Hinojosa batting in the six hole. Sophomore from Spring, Texas. This is a young Texas ball club. Longhorns went 38 and 18 in the regular season. 13 and 11 in Big 12 play. They lost three out of the last four Big 12 series and went two and two in a conference tournament. Hinojosa staying alive. Another pitch fouled off. Texas team that's remade its identity with the play of talented freshmen throughout the roster. Round ball through on the left side. And Hinojosa with a leadoff single. So man on for... Colin Shaw. A tough stretch for head coach Augie Garrido. The all-time winning as coach in NCAA college baseball. 1,912 wins. But at 75 years old in his 18th season as the head coach of Texas with five national titles under his belt. There's no guarantee from his athletic director that he'll be back next year. Here's a sacrifice attempt. Texas leads the nation in sacks. And Shaw is able to advance in a Hosa. 88 sacrifice bunt called for by Augie Garrido this season. Well, it's just the baseball that they play. I mean, they understand the situation they're in. Not a whole lot of power hitters, and especially in that ballpark at home, hard to hit a home run. So you put pressure on defenses in different ways. Some teams like a UL or maybe an Ole Miss or Kentucky, they pressure you up at the plate because they can flat out swing and they can hit out of the ballpark pretty regular. And then there's other clubs that put pressure on you by speed, running, bunting, making your defense perform. Texas is very good at moving guys in the scoring position and taking two chances to get them home. Here's Casey Clemens, first offering up by Troy Stein, and on the wild pitch, Hinojosa moves to third. 
And let's not forget about base running. Nice job by Hinojosa right there. Reads the ball down. It's always down angle as a runner when you're on the bases. And he did a good job of reading a down angle on a breaking ball right there. Watch him. He's aggressive. You see him in the top of your screen. He sees the ball down angle. He sees it's going to bounce, and he took off. No hesitation. Chop to first. Langford looks him back and takes it to the bag for the second out. And put a star by that one right there. I mean, we talk about these opportunities, and that was a big opportunity for Texas right there. But if somehow Mingling can get out of this, and when you get that guy at third base and less than two out, and all you got to do is hit a ground ball to the middle infielders or a sack fly, you got to find a way to get those runs home. Those are valuable opportunities. And if Mingling can come up with a big base hit right here, huge momentum swinger. Zane Gerwitz looks at the first offering. This is one of those youngsters that has really helped to turn around this Texas program. Freshman from San Antonio out of Churchill High School. He's riding a five-game hit streak now. Take his average to 286. There have been a couple of guys in this Texas roster that had spots last season that saw those spots get lost over the course of the fall and once regular season played out. Augie Garrido says we, we wouldn't be anywhere without those upperclassmen, including Jacob Felt and Alex Silver, guys who didn't let the lack of playing time and the lost playing time affect their attitudes around this program. And it takes a special kid to do that, a kid that goes into your last year knowing this is your last year you're ever going to play competitive baseball, most probably. You've been a starter the year before, and all of a sudden now, some freshmen come in, some junior college transfers, and you end up sitting the bench most of the year. It takes a special person to keep a good attitude through that. Four-pitch walk to Zane Gerwitz turns the lineup over for Brooks Marlowe. All Marlowe did was Homer first time he was up. There's a look at Feltz in the Texas dugout. That home run for Marlowe was his third of the season. And the 16th time that Texas has homered, away from Austin. That's a total of 20 home runs in the season. 16 of them have come on the road or in neutral site games. They had a monster series in the finale at Kansas State. Hit four home runs in the final game. That was the most in one game for Texas since they hit five against Missouri in 2010. Talking with the Texas players yesterday, they said, yeah, we, we certainly play a different brand of baseball on the road. We can sit back and play for the big inning. That just won't happen at home. Marlowe looks at a fastball for a strike. And that's really odd to hear that a team would play so differently at home versus on the road. That huge ballpark in Austin where it's tough to hit one out. It's a slow infield. That one got by the catcher coming home from third is Hinojosa. No play there and a wild throw. Chance to move to third and advancing is Gerwitz. Mangdon and Stein just aren't on the same page. Well, you talk about pressure, ways to put pressure on teams. And Texas, again, don't hit it very well typically. But they do the little things right. They're good, a, a good base running bunch. And we saw Reed down angle while you're on the bases. Ball's bouncing in the dirt. They're moving. No doubt about it. Again, Hinojosa found his way to third base by reading down angle from second base. And then there's another ball that bounces. That ball's only 15 feet from home plate, but yet he finds a way to get home. Mangdon had uncorked seven wild pitches over the course of the season. He's thrown two here in this inning. Fly ball, center field. Bratson has plenty of room. But the Longhorns are able to add to their tally. A single, a walk, a couple wild pitches in his 3-1 to one Texas. time today just the 21st neutral site meeting in a series that began in 1903 so who heads home happy 
among that duo here today. Talking with Texas assistant coach Tommy Nicholson before the game today, he said, I loved playing in College Station. He said there was nothing like it. He said, I, I don't know if it's what it's like for other games, but when we went there as Texas and the fans were out to give you a hard time during batting practice, there was nothing like this rivalry in playing against Texas A&M, especially in College Station. There's Teenick in his second season as an assistant coach for Augie Garrido. Went to the World Series as a player for this Texas program. Fine second baseman. Yeah, those folks at College Station can be tough. I remember my, my weekend I spent there. Blake Alamon fouls one off, two and one. It seems like if you think about their baseball history especially. Texas A&M seems like a perfect fit in the SEC. You know, you say Texas A&M, I think of a program like Mississippi State. Yeah. Or somewhere, someone similar. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, this is A&M's eighth straight regional. They've won three of them. They know their way around regionals for sure. Their 30th NCAA tournament, including their eighth straight. A&M has been to the College World Series five times. They were last there in 2011. And they had tremendous success closing out their Big 12 run, as Alamon can't find that offering on the payoff pitch. This is a Texas A&M program, which won three of its last six Big 12 tournaments they participated in, 07, 2010, and 2011. And while Texas missed the last two postseasons, Texas A&M spent last year in Corvallis. That was a, an odd year for the state of Texas. Long one of the hotbeds in college baseball. Here's Ryan Burke. Last year was the first time since 1995 there was no regional in the state of Texas. Rice had to go on the road to Eugene. Texas San Antonio was in Corvallis along with A&M. This year there is so much talent in the state in the postseason. These two teams here. Rice later on tonight. Sam Houston State. And over in Fort Worth, TCU is having an incredible season. Pitch upstairs to Burke, two balls and a strike. Yeah, TCU, not really a weak spot. If anything, it's their homers that they've hit on the season. But a boy, pitching, defense, and batting average-wise, TCU's outstanding. And hot on top of that. Low and in, three balls and a strike. TCU, good lineup, great pitching. Couple of bases and one of the best closers in baseball. Burke draws the walk. Well, here's what we're talking about. Texas teams overall struggled last season. The Longhorns this year, though, 38 wins, 13 in conference play, and one of the reasons they didn't make it in the postseason last year. Now, eight regional teams this season in the Lone Star State and two host sites. The eight postseason teams tied for the most all time. Well, TCU's rotation, you know, Morris and Finnegan to the top in the country without a doubt. I mean, their team ERA 2.26 for TCU. And these Texas teams can pitch, too. I mean, some of the top pitching, obviously, we talked about Texas. TCU, outstanding. Houston has an unbelievable team ERA, second best in the country. Burke is the runner at first for Cole Lankford, who struck out his first time up. Thornhill. Misses away.
332 average now for Lankford. Second on the team at home runs with four. Clemens holds Burke. Fouled straight back. Hey, we're going to show you the change-up grip here before long of Nathan Thornhill. And it's fun to talk to these guys, especially college pitchers, to find out how they settle on grips and how many different generations they go through. Different models that they find to be successful. Thornhill is a high school quarterback. And he said that had a big part to do with his follow-through. Talk about throwing a football and following through by turning your hand over and pointing mm -hmm. your thumb down. He said that was a big part about throwing a changeup. Look at this funky changeup grip. Have yeah, you I mean, ever seen like that? No, that's not the norm. So if you're thinking, you know, changeup, and I'm going to learn how to throw a changeup, that'd be a tough one. It's almost like a circle change because you can see the pointer finger and the thumb almost come together, but it's a little bit different than even the circle change is. Popped up to left. Johnson to the bullpen. Certainly not the conventional way you're taught to throw a changeup. You know, but there's so many grips and different things. I mean, what works for one guy may not work for the other. You know, just like I can hold a two-seam fastball, we can both throw it the same. Yours may have great movement to it, but mine straight is an error, and we're holding it the same way. So everybody's just a little bit different on grips and the way they throw their pitches. The only movement my pitch would ever have would be powered by gravity. Well, you know, that, that, that's part of movement, you know. It's <laughs> like a changeup. It's got a good gravity pull to it. Your years in Major League Baseball, a Golden Spikes Award winner at LSU and Olympic champion. How, many, how often did you just in a bullpen session or playing catch in the outfield? There goes the runner, pitch is fouled off. Compare grips with other pitchers to see how they did things and to experiment on your own. All the time. You know, because you know, if I had a, one of my teammates had a really good breaking bar or a good changeup, I always go, hey, how do you hold that? You know, and, and he showed me his grip, and I, and I would try it. You know, and if I could make it work, it was good. But you're always picking each other's brain. I mean, that's why the pitchers stick together and the hitters stick together. But I was always picking, you know, the guy's brains out there. Joe Sluzarski from UNO showed me the split finger fastball or fork ball, whatever you want to call it. I used to pick Messina's brain about his changeup because he had a really good changeup when we went to Orioles together. Lifted to left, has a chance to get down. Ben Johnson is there, though, and that will push Burke. Back to the bag, two down. I mean, you can't gather enough information talking to guys, you know. And our visit with uh, Coach Graham yesterday from Rice, I mean, how much fun is he to talk to about pitching? You oh know, he, he can talk on and on and on. And I just like, you know, sitting there listening to that guy because Coach Bertman's a good guy to talk about pitching. And Coach Graham's a good guy to talk if you want to learn. And there's different ways of saying things to make it work to young athletes and players today. But... Coach Grand, you can tell you, he, don't, he not only coaches this game, but he absolutely loves the pitching side of it. It's, it's a passion. It's his life. Here's Nick Banks. Texas owes a big thank you to Wayne Graham, by the way. I think Graham's first head coaching job was at San Jacinto Junior College in 1981, where the mm -hmm. staff was led by a hard-throwing right-hander by the name of Roger Clemens. His son Casey playing at first today for Texas. Lemons would go on to Texas with Calvin Chiraldi, Spike Owens, and a host of others win the 1983 national championship. Banks to the right side. Casey Clemens has it, and he has the bag. Another runner stranded by AM. It's three to one, Texas. Welcome back to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. Beautiful day on the campus of Rice University as we get started. First of two today, Texas leads Texas AM. For more coverage of the Division I baseball tournament and interactive brackets, go to NCAA.com. Already some incredible performances out there today. Long Beach State top North Carolina in the Gainesville Regional. Andrew Warbach, sophomore for the Dirtbags, pitched eight shutout innings versus North Carolina.
bottom of the third, two, three, four hitters do up. Johnson, Payton, and Barrera. And Johnson reached on a chopper to short his first time up. Was able to advance to second on a throwing error by Logan Taylor. Second offering low, 2-0. Oh. Well, Mingman's got to find a way here to stop the bleeding again. I mean, every inning, Texas got him for two in the first, one in the second. He's got to put a goose egg up here eventually. The a and going to have a chance. Three runs on four hits allowed by Mangdon. He's sitting at 35 pitches now. Texas got a leadoff home run from Brooks Marlowe in the first inning. Longhorns are 18 and 2 this season when they score first. Yeah, and Texas has found a way. Leadoff batter's been on each of the first two innings. There's ball four upstairs to Ben Johnson. Texas comes into this regional as the two seed. They went two and two in the Big 12 Conference Tournament. The folks at boysworld.com usually put out NCAA RPIs. And this is a Texas team which won 13 Big 12 games back in the regional for the first time since 2011. They won 30 of their first 38 games before kind of scuffling back end of conference play. But in terms of published probabilities to win this regional, Texas, or win their regional, Texas has the highest percentage for any two seed in the country, 46.9. That's better, in fact, than what Rice has been projected in terms of their percentage to win this. So the odds makers, based on Texas's season, their success away from home especially, say that the Longhorns are the favored team in this regional as the two seed. Yeah, I think those odds would change if they knew about Dylan Peters Great point. and his injury. You know, I mean, when you lose your two guy, it's tough, and so. There's Peters. Top three among active Big 12 pitchers with an ERA just over two and a quarter. 17 career wins for the junior from Indianapolis. That started a no-hitter at Kansas State on May 17th. Seven innings in that one. So unavailable with an elbow injury. We're talking with some of the Texas guys yesterday, they said, you know, he uncorked a fastball that came in at about 78. We said, whoa, something's not right. Another throw to first to keep Johnson near the bag. He has 20 stolen bases this season in 20 attempts. Texas as a team, successful at an 86% clip. Ball missed away, one ball and one strike. From Daniel Mangdon to Mark Payton, who extended with an RBI single in the first inning. A Big 12 record now, 96 consecutive games. He's reached base safely. Extended the streak against Baylor with a walk off. He's got a flair for the dramatic. Senior from Chicago out of St. Rita High School. And Mangdon misses with a fastball. Yeah, Mingman just, you know, unable to find it. I mean, he's much better than what he's pitched so far. If you look at his numbers on the year, only 27 walks and 100, over 100 innings pitched, which is pretty doggone good. But he's been behind most of the time today. He does have two walks already through the first two-plus innings. Seems like almost every batter he's pitched behind, which, of course, get a lot of pitches. Pitch count's going up. I don't know if pitch count going up, but tally a few more for all those throws to first keeping Johnson near the bag Aggies have gotten a lefty up in their bullpen well you can just tell by watching just doesn't have the command of the fastball and, and like I said it's been 2-0 3-1 almost every hitter 3-2 yep and here we are again you know tries to throw a 2-1 change up right there and misses and now it's three and one only six first pitch strikes to 11 batters and if he's if he's not commanding the fastball, I assume it's going to be a long day for him. Absolutely, and that, that's what any pitcher, you know, it, it's hard. To, I mean, when you pitch behind in the count at any level, I don't care if it's 
you know, tournament ball on the weekends, it's high school ball, college pro ball. If you're consistently behind in the count and having to throw fastballs and fastball counts, uh, you're going to have a hard time being successful a lot of times. So the count goes full to Peyton. Bob Childress, who was the pitching coach at Nebraska before getting the head job at Texas A&M, now has uh, a lot on his plate and to concern himself with in terms of his rotation over the course of this weekend. This is a weekend where you not just think about winning this game, but you've got to project throughout the rest of the tournament. Big swing and a miss on the fastball. Mangdon battles back to get Peyton. Boy, he had commanded that one through a two-seam sinking type fastball down and away to Peyton. And Peyton, we know how good he is. Ball's got some movement. It's got some giddy up on it right there, too. Just threw it right by him. I mean, 3-2 fastball, fastball count. Peyton couldn't catch up with you. That just goes to show you what kind of stuff Mingdon does have. Well, if he's got a lefty ready to go in the bullpen, and there are four left-handed hitters in this Texas lineup, by the way. Pitch out, nothing doing with Johnson over at first. At what point are we past the point of no return to get Mangdon back out there before the weekend comes to a close for Texas A&M? He's at 44 pitches now. Well, I mean, I think you're getting close. I mean, I, I think he can get up to 50, 55. I mean, you're hoping he kind of finds it and starts to get it going. It's a tough pitch out call for the first pitch because he struggled on getting ahead of guys, and that puts him in the hole right away, and now it's 2-0. and oh. But there's some guys down at the back end of that a and M bullpen that can shut you down as well, so that could be a thought. Getting him out, he doesn't have his best stuff today, and let him sit for a day or two and try to get him back in. Run of three straight righties in this Texas lineup at this point, starting with Barrera, who looks at a strike. But I tell you, one thing about Mingdon I've noticed over the years is he will compete with anybody. I mean, he understands he doesn't have his best stuff yet today, but he's going to give you everything he's got on every pitch when he's out there. There'll be no quitting him. In the third inning of work, he's thrown 46 pitches. Is it this something that a pitcher can find and find a rhythm? Oh, I think so, yeah. I mean, you, it's just like a hitter. You know, you can look bad two or three times at the plate, and all of a sudden you find your rhythm. Same thing with a pitcher. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than others, and I, I can remember in my career struggling for the first couple of innings, but then finding it all of a sudden and then roll for about four or five innings. Swing and a fly ball, deep left center field. Bratchen back. That one is off the base of the wall. Heading into second, Barrera with a one-out double. And it wasn't a clean relay in. A&M lucky to keep Ben Johnson locked at third. Well, Bratson, the center fielder. The coach talked about how much he likes Bratson, but he played this as well as you could play it. I mean, off the wall, grabs it and gets it in. A little hang-up on the relay throw, but by that time, Johnson had already been held up at third and couldn't score. Again, behind in the count, fastball, I'm talking about middle of the plate. This ball is hammered out, but watch Bratson. Bratson will get it right off the wall, one hop in, and here it comes, and that's quick. And, of course, that's what third base coach is looking at right there. He won't see how quickly the ball gets in, headed that direction. Right there, he's got the stop sign up. See, he's holding him right there before the bobble's made. Here's Madison Carter with two in scoring position now and one down. Yeah, you can see the corner infielders, Lankford and Notterbrook. They'll be in even with the bags right here. Ground ball to them. Of course, they'll check the runner at third, make sure he's headed back to the bag, and they'll go across the diamond. Middles are back. He's one of these situations from Carter and Texas right here. If you can find a way just to hit a ground ball. Sounds simple, but it's harder to do, but not try to do too much. Sack fly is great. Ground ball to the shortstop, ground ball to the second baseman, plates you a run. And there it is to the second baseman, gloved by Alamon, and the throw pulls Lankford off the bag. Death by a thousand paper cuts for the last few runs for Texas. And that's what Texas does to you. You know, it's about, again, constant pressure, although they've hit a, ball, a couple of balls really hard today, one home run and one double. But they do a good job finding ways, doing the little things right. I mean, it's just good baseball. You can call it what you want to call it, small ball, 
West Coast style baseball. I call it just good baseball. Lead Winning off. baseball. Yeah, the leadoff man has gotten on for Augie Garrido via home run, a single, and a walk now through three innings. And this might be the point of no return for Daniel Magnus sitting at 50 pitches now. And C.J. Hinojosa coming up with the runners in the corners. Each leadoff hitter has scored for Texas. Line drive left center. Bratson won't catch up to this one. He'll cut it off right before the wall. Barrera has scored. Carter coming down the line. He's across. And it's another base hit for Texas. Hinojosa drives in a pair. Watch the location of this pitch again. Ball's up in the strike zone, but you got to give Texas credit. You know, Mingan hadn't made his pitches. He's not had his stuff today. He's been behind the count most of the time and up in the zone when he did throw a strike, and that's a deadly, deadly combination for him. But Texas has taken advantage of that. They haven't missed some balls they should have hit, and they made AM pay for it. And that'll chase Mangan. Still responsible for the runner at second. Six runs on seven hits. A couple of walkouts and a strike. But two lefties coming up for Texas. Rupp Childress goes to the bullpen for left-hander Matt Kent. Longhorns in control, six to one. Six to one, Texas with the lead over Texas A&M, matching a career high allowed by Daniel Mangdon with six runs, and he's responsible for one more. So Matt Kent enters the game. Kent, a lefty from Waco, Texas, at a Midway High School, stands six feet even, 175 pounds. Kent is a guy that can be used as a lefty specialist or can stretch out a little bit. He threw five innings earlier this season at Mississippi State, went three and a third against LSU, but has thrown a total of two innings over his last three outings, two in the Ole Miss series and in the SEC tournament. Walked a man and got a man out on just 11 pitches against Arkansas. 19th appearance, he's 3-1. and one. 27 walks. You see, he can strike you out, too, with 29 strikeouts as well. Big situation for him. I mean, just one out, run at second base. A&M's got to find a way to stop it if they're going to have any chance at all. And there's a lot of baseball. I mean, you've got to remember, we're only in the fourth inning. He's got to come in and be effective against these next two lefties. Colin Shaw is the first, and he sends this one into the A&M faithful down the left side. Shaw laid down a sacrifice his first time up. Longhorns lead at 6-1, to one, and we're only in the third. The leadoff man has scored every inning for Texas. Breaking ball blocked by Troy Stein. Lefties in, in a stat that may surprise you when you look at Kent's overall numbers. After this, the 1-1 one -one is pulled to the right side and through by Shaw. Coming around third, Hinojosa, the throw is late, and he's safe. RBI single for Shaw. Who hits lefties better than he does righties. 333 batting average against Southpaws, and he made that one count. Well, Texas certainly doesn't look like a team that came in with a 266 team batting average. That's their eighth hit. We're not even through three yet. Seven runs put up. But again, they are away from home, and the numbers say they're a much better. And I don't know if it's a mental thing. I don't know if you walk into that ballpark and all of a sudden say, Oh, it's a tough place to hit. Yeah. And you get defeated when you walk in because you see how big it is. 
or whatever you want to call it, they found a way in neutral sites and on the road to be a lot more effective this year, that's for sure. They score better than five runs a game away from home, just over four at home. Casey Clemens looks at a strike. Their batting average is 50 points higher away from home. Their on-base percentage is 20 points higher. I mean, that's, that's significant. When you talk about 50 points, I mean, you can see 20 points. You know, 20 is a lot, but 50 points is a ton. This Texas team has played six fewer games away from home, and they've hit 12 more home runs away from home. Casey Clemens grounded out early in his first at bat. Another K kid for Roger, Kobe, Cody, and Corey, his brothers. Clemens' family lives here in Houston. Casey went to Memorial High School. One of the freshmen that has really made an impact in this Texas program this season. And Casey's hitting six of his last seven games and has driven in eight. didn't miss by much. I've always thought that the popularity of the College World Series, specifically in college baseball overall, really blossomed when guys like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens went and had the success that they did in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. And folks said, wow, I remember that guy when he threw in Omaha. Oh, that guy when he played at Arizona State. Oh, absolutely. You can see the Rice championships in that last shot down the right field line under the batting cages. But, you know, yeah, when it went, that's where I remember it, when it, when it really got on TV pretty regular. Sure. You looked forward, kind of like Monday Night Baseball as a kid. You looked forward to it. Not many games were televised when I was a kid, but the World Series in Omaha always was, and so you couldn't wait to watch that. You know, it was an exciting brand of baseball. Balls flying out of the ballpark. It's all some really, really quality players, you know, when a lot of quality players went to play college ball. You know, and then we got in that span where you know, lost a lot of good players. They end up going straight to pro ball, but now you see more players going back to college a lot because of the, I think, slot limits and the draft and where you can get drafted and how much money you're going to get. I think it's going to send, you know, a lot more players back to the college game. Here's the eighth batter of the third inning for Augie Garrido's Longhorns. It's Zane Gerwitz, who drew a walk his first time up. But to see Roger Clemens go from Omaha in 83 mm -hmm. to a World Series championship with Calvin Schiraldi and company in 86. Oh, well, wait a second. Maybe that... That college team I was watching three years ago was really good. Runner goes, <laughs> yeah. throw to second is in time. Beautiful tag by Blake Alamon as Troy Stein, who only catches 24% of base runners, is able to retire Colin Shaw. Throw from Stein was a strike, and Alamon with the tag finally ends the Texas third. This game started Texas's way, and it continues that way. Brooks Marlowe with a leadoff home run in the first inning. Then Colin Shaw able to drive in C.J. Hinojosa. Aggressive base running for the Longhorns, and they chase A&M starter Daniel Mangdon after just two and a third inning. A four-run third inning for Texas. Leadoff man has reached all three innings, and he's come around to score, and the Longhorn faithful love this start. Back in the postseason for the first time in three years, and they have a 7-1 to one lead as we hit the fourth inning at Rice. Logan Nottebrook will lead off the fourth for Texas A&M. The Aggies have had some opportunities against Nathan Thornhill, but they're just one for nine with runners on base. We talked earlier about the quick start to the season for Nottebrook back on February 22nd against Sacramento State, a postseason team. He went two for five with a couple of home runs. Two run walk-off home run. He got underneath this one, Ben Johnson. 
at plenty of time. There's one down. First game of two today. Later on tonight, the one seed Rice. Back home and hosting again. We'll take on four seed George Mason. They're no strangers to the postseason. Then the winners meet Saturday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central. And remember, the regionals are double elimination. So even falling into the loser's bracket, you still have an opportunity, but then it comes down to pitching, pitching, pitching. Yeah, if you're going to fall in the loser's bracket early, you better be deep in pitching. You know, I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of clubs out there that are, but, I mean, you've got to be really deep. And, of course, Texas is. If they were to fall in the loser's bracket, they could do it. Rice could probably do it. Houston can do it. LSU could probably do it. You know, there's some teams out there. But you don't want to be in that loser's bracket, obviously. Troy Stein is 0 for 1 with a ground out to short. You were on the selection show a couple of nights ago. You know, earlier this week, I should say. One thing you pointed out, we've talked about. Is it you put the number 30. You think there's about 30 teams that could honestly win this whole thing. There really isn't. There's not that. It's not that top-heavy where you have one, two, or three breakaway teams like we've seen in the past. No, I mean, it's for a lot of different reasons. One is the bat. The bat changed the game four years ago. We introduced these BB core bats, and now you don't see as much offense. You don't see the big bangers that you used to see, so it brings a lot of teams back into play. The second thing that brings it back into play is when and if you do get to Omaha, it's such a big ballpark, you really can't hit a homer at all right there, so it brings a lot of other teams back into play and, and, and look we've talked about this we weren't talking about good, good strikeout right there on the outside corner we weren't talking about mississippi state this time of year last year we weren't talking about ucla they played for the national championship and then two years ago we certainly weren't talking about arizona who got hot from a pitching standpoint and they could hit throughout the year but their pitching was very average but their pitching got hot down the stretch and so they win the national championship so it is so much different than when i played really you know, back in the late 80s, there was really four or five teams every year that had a real chance to win it, and those teams were probably going to one of those were, but now it's just whoever can get hot and play, elevate their game when they need to will be your national champion again this year. Logan Taylor at the plate, back and healthy once again. I was uh, in Columbia, South Carolina earlier this season for Gamecocks in Alabama, and a South Carolina fan stopped, stopped me in the coffee shop and he said, who's the next Stony Brook? Hmm. And what do you make of Cal Poly? Is Cal Poly legit? Is Louisiana Lafayette legit? The college baseball fan is now hip to the fact that you don't have to be a perennial power to have success in the postseason. No, no doubt about that. Just some talent, some guys with a dream and playing baseball above your head. You know, and everybody talks about Stony Brook, not because the players weren't any good. People don't know this, but Stony Brook had more players drafted that year than LSU did. They were actually a more talented team. The shock was Stony Brook, nobody had ever heard of really Stony Brook, and they had a wonderful year. I mean, they had a kid in center field. I can't call his name, but he was a first-round draft pick that year, so they had some talent. That's a second walk from Nathan Thornhill as it puts Taylor aboard here in the fourth to extend the inning for Jay Statham. Statham drove in A&M's lone run in the second inning. Well, the history of college baseball and postseason success has been written by the underdog really since Rodado's runs, mm -hmm. since LSU's runs. I thought one of the biggest underdogs was Pat Casey's Oregon State team, which was made up of a bunch of kids from the Pacific Northwest that didn't leave the state and stayed right there, and they won back-to-back -back national championships. Yeah. Fresno State. Didn't Fresno State yes. get in as a number four seed in a right. regional years ago? Fresno State had to win their conference tournament just to get in yeah. as a four seed. That's right. And they end up winning the whole thing. And you get hot at the right time. I mean, that's that's what it's all about, you know. And, and whether you like the college game the way it is now with the bats, I mean, it's just the way it is. And so Skip Johnson, the pitching coach, will come out to have a word with his starter, Nathan Thornhill. Thornhill had the walk to Logan Taylor. And now behind in the count, 2-0 to Jay Stadium. It should be a great weekend for college baseball throughout, but especially right here in Houston. Tom Hart alongside Ben McDonald. We'll see Rice later on tonight, the number yeah. one seed. But everybody was really excited for this matchup because of the rivalries. What effect, if any, do you think emotion has had in the beginning of this game? I haven't seen a whole lot of emotion. I mean, uh, maybe the guys were telling the truth yesterday when they told us, hey, 
We're happy to be here. It's just another game. Yes, it is a big rivalry from the past, but hey, we know the, we heard them say, hey, we played against each other. A lot of these guys played against each other in summer ball in high school and so on and so forth. So it's almost like it is another game, but certainly Texas has been the dominant team to this point. Here's a 2-0 pitch now to Statham, and after the visit from the pitching coach, it's in there for a strike. So Skip Johnson's done such a tremendous job with this Texas pitching. Six top ten finishes in ERA in the nation in his eight seasons as a pitching coach for Augie Garrido. Stadium fouls it out of play, two and two. Pitchers that we talked to yesterday, so one thing we really love about Skip Johnson as a coach is he keeps us loose. Mm -hmm. And he knows how to appeal to our competitive side, and that might be different from player to player. Yeah, because the old bullpen workouts get boring, but then they started to say, well, they had contests. Who could hit the most spots? Who could throw it in? You got points for it, and they made contests out of it. So you got to keep it competitive. Soft line drive snared by a diving Brooks Marlowe. There's that Texas defense we heard so much about. Yeah, the offense has been great for the Longhorns. But now there's some leather as Marlowe goes Superman to end the fourth. Oh. Texas leads Texas A&M 7-1 as we move to the home half of the fourth inning. Longhorns come in with one of the best weekend rotations in college baseball. George Mason, who we see later tonight in the nightcap, also has a great one. I think the kids are having fun here at Reckling Park today. First pitch lifted in the right field by Gerwitz, and there's one down. We told you earlier that Texas will be without their number two starter, Dylan Peters, throughout the course of the mm -hmm. postseason. And that's a tough break, and news out west Arizona State lost their number one starter Brett Lillick left the game in the first inning today with an injury while covering first on the back end of a double play attempt he only went two-thirds of an inning that's a tough break for Arizona State yeah and you say how good was Dylan Peters I mean seven and three with a 2.13 ERA there's that young man right there having a, a sore arm sore elbow you know, we couldn't figure out these road neutral splits for Texas. And with our offense was so great and their pitching was also so great away from home. Dylan Peters is pitching to a 1.69 ERA away from Austin. Augie Garrido might want to send a petition. Let's go ahead and play all road games next year. So Nathan Thornhill, better ERA on the road. And Peters as well. We talked with Parker French yesterday, and he said one way that Dylan Peters will really help out over the course of this weekend is with such a great baseball mind. There's French, another starter, standing up behind him. Is that he will help the rest of the staff. He has such a great baseball mind. He'll help us from a scouting perspective. He'll help us between innings. Little dribbler from Marlowe. Alamon retires his second base counterpart, and there's two down. As A&M looks for its first one, two, three inning. But Ben Johnson coming up with two out. Johnson won for two, got a single, and the first came around to score. Remember, his single was uh, on a chopper to Logan Taylor. We threw it away. That put him in scoring position, and he wouldn't have scored without the benefit of that error. Came around on a Mark Payton single, a batter later. And walked and scored in the third. Taylor back in action after missing last few weeks of the regular season with a dislocated kneecap. Yeah, you know, it takes some time. I mean, when you sit out three weeks, your timing as a hitter is off. You, you know, ground balls. We saw him make a throwing error in the first inning. Got to wonder, you know. But, I mean, he's been the guy there all year long. He's been your best shortstop. So when he gets healthy... You're running back out there, but you know the risk of running him back out there, and you just got to let him play his way through it. Unfortunately, you know, it all started with an error there in the first inning, but Texas has just been too good so far. I mean, Mignon struggled, and Texas took advantage of it. Two balls and two strikes to Johnson.
And Johnson, honorable mention, all Big 12 performer. A little squibber to first behind the back, Lankford to the race, and he just beat him as Johnson went in feet first. It's a one, two, three frame for Texas. We'll talk more about this Texas program as we get legendary head coach Augie Garrido on the headset when we return to Houston. I mean. Tom Harwood, Ben McDonald's 7 to 1 lead for Texas in the fifth inning. We apologize. Audio difficulties kept us from bringing a chat with Augie Garrido to the air. It's always fun to chat with him, especially with Texas enjoying this lead. And getting great pitching from Nathan Thornhill, who's walked three today. It's really been the only issue. He's held Texas A&M to just still run on three hits. Ray Bratson is the leadoff man for Texas A&M. You know, you mentioned it earlier, Ben. There's a lot of time left for A&M. But in terms of opportunities, this may be a great one. Bratson is a great runner. He has the green light on the base pads, and if you want to put some pressure on Thornhill, everybody uh, after Bratson will be coming up to face Thornhill for the third time. Yeah, I mean, you almost get in a situation where you start to take a pitch. You know, you try to work your way. you got to have base runners at this point. Obviously, you can't hit an eight-run homer. And there it is, the leadoff single for Trey Bratson. But you maybe put him in a situation you make him throw it. Because Thornhill has, pitch count has gotten up a little bit, you know. So you maybe, but again, the bad news about that is Texas' bullpen is really good on top of that. But if your A&M is just small ball right now, it's just trying to get some guys on base. Maybe you get an error here or there. And then maybe you get a big blow with a couple of guys on and get right back in the ball game. Texas A&M was third in the SEC this season with a 286 team batting average. Not, not a ton of pop. Top half of the league with 24 home runs. Like Alamon at the plate. Nothing in one. Alamon is one for two with a single and a stolen base. A&M could get running with these two guys, though. It's almost like having back-to-back -back leadoff hitters with Bratson aboard now. He has 18 stolen bases. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what you do a lot of times. Stack the, the speed at the top and towards the bottom. And that way you get some guys on that can move. And then you get to the beef of your lineup in Langford, Banks, and not a Brook who can drive them in. They, you know, it's worked pretty well for them this year, but it, it, they just have to chip away. Don't try to get five or six in one inning. Just get two or three here and there, and then get right back in this ball game. Biggest issue for A&M today has been coming up with clutch hits, just two for ten with runners on base. In the center, Peyton drifting, Johnson over, and Mark Peyton with the grab. One down. And that will bring Ryan Burke to the plate. Well, you know, Thornhill's done a good job. We saw, we talked so much and heard so much about the changeup, but it has been his fastball that he's really lived off of mostly today. We've seen a few changeups and some good ones. But he almost kind of knew what the scouting report was on him for the Aggies, and he said, well, I'm just going to do something totally different. He's thrown a lot of fastballs, <laughs> but he stayed out of the middle of the plate, and that's the key. I mean, that's been the difference between these two pitchers. If you saw Ming, a lot of balls were up and elevated and in the middle of the plate, where Thornhill on the other high side has been down at the knees and staying out of the middle of the plate, and that's his recipe to success as a pitcher is staying down and staying on the corners. Burke is 0 for 1. Drew Walk is last time up. There goes the runner. Pitch is ripped into right field. That will get down in front of Shaw. And A&M in business with runners at the corners with one out. Give Coach Rob Childers a lot of credit. A lot of coaches, when they get down and get way behind, will kind of shut the offense down. But a little hit and run action right there. As you saw, Bratson taking off on the pitch. And now the three-hole hitter, Cole Langford. A&M one for four with runners in scoring position today. Bratson at third. Burke at first. Now, you know, Thornhill's been really good with the middle of the A&M lineup. If you look at Lankford, he's 0 for 2. Banks 0 for 2. And Nottebrook 0 for 1. So that's 0 for 5 by the heart of that lineup for A&M. Went off of Lankford's foot in the batter's box. A foul ball. We'll do it again with a count nothing and one. You know, you, you were talking earlier about Texas being such a good defensive team. There, it seems like there are no holes out there. 
They're tenth in the nation in double plays. Mm -hmm. You put it in the air in this ballpark, the wind really not doing anything positive for the hitters. There's nowhere to go against Nathan Thornhill. No, there's not. I mean, you almost got to get fortunate with a few base hits in a row, then maybe doesn't likely to happen, but Texas makes an error or two, and you find a way to get back in the ballgame. Offering is low and away to Langford, one and one. This is a fair ballpark in many respects. 330 down the lines, 375 of the gaps, and 400 to center. Now the wind almost blowing in from left center field, you know, so it's going to make it really tough to get one out of here. In the college game, you can still fake to third and look to first, as Thornhill did. Six run Texas lead. Lankford this season hitting 382 with runners in scoring position. Couldn't find the hot breaking ball. Looked like a changeup or a slider that he left high. That's just like a hanging slider right there, and unfortunately. Lankford went at it, you know, a little bit too aggressive at that point. That's what you got to be careful. I mean, if a and is going to climb back in this thing, they got to be careful. They got to stay in the zone and not do, try to do too much. Lankford had a big, big swing right there trying to hit the three-run homer. And that's not like Lankford. I mean, you watched him this year. I mean, that's why his average is so high. He sprays the ball. He does a good job of hitting you know, hitting it where it's pitched. I've seen a lot of base hits to left field, left center field, goes with the fastball away as well as anyone. Cole Langford, a Houston kid out of Lamar High School. Team high 57 start today. Chase the fastball away. Was that fastball away set up by the high slider? Well, I don't know if it was set up, but what is set up is the fact that they know, again, A&M knows that Thorn Thornhill has a really good changeup. So in the back of your mind, you go up there thinking, well, with two strikes, I'm going to wait a little bit longer because I know he's got a good changeup. I don't want to get fooled by the off-speed pitch. And Thornhill has enough on the fastball at 88, 89 miles an hour that he can throw it by you if you got the thought of that changeup in your mind. You know, that's twice we've seen Lankford swing late on the ball, two-seam fastball kind of down and away from him. Now Nick Banks to the plate. He's the cleanup man for Texas A&M. He's homered just twice this season. The big power waits behind him in Nottebrook. Nothing in one to Nick Banks. Banks sitting on a seven-game hit streak, 385 coming into today during that streak. Got off to a slow start to the season. The last 40 games or so, he's been on quite a tear. 379 batting average over the last 41 games for the freshman. Out of play to the left side. You think some of these A&M hitters maybe overthought the Thornhill changeup? I think so. I mean, that's obvious to me. I mean, now give Thornhill credit. Well, he's thrown a lot of fastballs, but he hadn't left many in the middle of the plate enough. It's been really quality stuff. I mean, he's walked three, struck out four now. Came See? back with a fastball over the outside corner. That's the fifth K for Nathan Thornhill. Texas in a great spot. Up 7-1 over A&M. Ground ball chopped the first, the fumble home, the tag, not there. Longhorns win the game. Jonathan Walsh gets around the tag, and the Longhorns beat the Aggies in their final ever regular season meeting.
shared the same league for 100 years, the 369th meeting and the first ever meeting in the NCAA tournament. Three seed A&M, two seed Texas. And Mark Payton, a veteran in this Texas program at the plate, looks at the first two pitches for strikes from Matt Kent. This is a series which started according to the Texas Media Guide in 1903. According to the Texas A&M Media Guide, it started in 1904. Regardless, they've been playing baseball and all sports together against each other for more than a century. Southwest Conference folded on May 18th of 1996. Final day of the conference was highlighted by the conference track and field meet and the final Southwest Conference baseball tournament which was won by Rice. And that kicked off a stretch of for Rice that is still active today 19 consecutive conference titles for Wayne Graham's program covers the Southwest Conference. The WAC Conference USA. They're in action in the nightcap. Against George Mason, Peyton staying alive. Southwest Conference was founded right here in Houston at the Rice Hotel. December 8th, 1914. And it was around from 1914 to 1996. Oh, good ball in for a strike. Yes. We talk about Kent's ability to come in and throw strikes. Not a hard thrower, but he's really, really tough on lefties, and that's just a big sweeper. Well, starts it right off the shoulder and sweeps it towards the outside corner right there. So Tress Barrera now to the plate. The base is empty and one out. We've seen through conference realignment the loss of some fantastic rivalries in college athletics. Logan Taylor. And that one was lost by Cole Lankford on a low throw. Uh, Lankford would have had the scoop and it just couldn't find its home. Now we talk about Taylor possibly being a little bit rusty after sitting out for a while. There's a couple of off throws for him, if you will, a couple of errors. Like he does everything right, sets his feet and throws it over, but just not enough on it to get it there in the air. Tough pick for Lankford. Third error today by AM. Two from Taylor. Here's Madison Carter. Chance for two. Alamon to Taylor, and they got this one there. A 4 6 3 double play. Second double play turned by the Aggies today. Head of the sixth inning, 2C Texas leads 3C Texas A&M in the first of two today from Rice. For more coverage of the Division I baseball tournament and interactive brackets, go to NCAA.com. Well, Rice and George Mason to follow us here today. And up in the Pacific Northwest, been a wonderful season for Pat Casey and his Oregon State Beavers, two-time national champions. They're the one seat up there once again. They'll be in the nightcap late night tonight. 11 o'clock Eastern on ESPNU. Prior to that, UNLV, which got off to a, a, just a tremendous start this season. And they hit a couple bumps in the road midway through the year. They'll take on the Eaters, the UC Irvine and Eaters, prior to that nightcap in Corvallis. Have you ever been to Corvallis? I have not. Great trip. The, uh, the Aggies, you know, and, and some of the folks in the traveling party were a little bit surprised. It was kind of the overall vibe of the Pacific Northwest. Here's yeah. Logan Nottebrook. First pitch, like a slider in there for a strike. Yeah, they, um, a couple guys did, did some shopping. One guy was at the bookstore. Another guy, you know, dropped by a convenience store to pick up some stuff. And they were surprised there. The Pacific Northwest, you know, they take the environment very seriously. Neither guy was offered a bag to put his purchases in. Hmm. They said, yeah, well, you want a bag, we'll sell it to you. 
sell it to yeah, you. He'll, you know, we'll tack so a dime or a quarter onto your chopping tool. Good, not. So the, the the Walmart's up there. They don't they don't no. give you a, a bag to put your groceries in. Well, you just pile them in the cart and dump them in the back of the truck and <laughs> drive them home. I mean, how does that work? You could, you could, yeah. I mean, bring your own bag, you know. I guess. I'll just bring a duffel bag and zip it up and pack it out on my back. I guess. We we honestly had. Uh, I was there with Mike Rooney last year for the Corvallis Regional. Um, Rooney and I look out. Second day, at the sixth inning and. A couple of folks decided to take in the game for free by bringing their climbing gear and literally climbing mm. halfway up some of the tall pines behind the wall in left field. Nice. Uh, so they sell you bags to put your groceries. They'll sell it to you. They'll sell it to Did you. Do they try to sell you air to breathe while you were up there, too? I mean, is that part of it? I mean, I mean if they're that conscious about everything, I mean, is the, is the air they selling that, too, huh? Well, it makes you think twice. You know, you well, get I home guess. from the store instead of... Throwing that bag away, you're going to reuse it. Yeah. You're going to take it back to the store with you. I like it. Pay off to Nottabrook. And he went fishing. That's a third consecutive strikeout for Nathan Thornhill. Gives him six here in this game. Yeah, which is a little higher percentage than we normally see out of him. I mean, he normally doesn't strike out a lot of guys. Remember, had 49 strikeouts and basically 84 innings pitch coming in. But... There it is again. It's again and again and again. He has stayed out of the middle of the plate. He has stayed down in the strike zone. I mean, bottom of the knees and on the corners. And again, if you can do that at any level you play, you can be successful as a pitcher. Here's the catcher, Troy Stein. First pitch, fastball missed low. You know, we were earlier in the, in the game, we showed you Nathan Thornhill's very awkward, I don't, I shouldn't say awkward, but very unique mm -hmm. changeup grip. And I'm curious, and we didn't get a chance to ask him this yesterday. How, as a pitcher, do you disguise your grip when you change it once you're set? Well, and you, especially when you have something weird like his change of Yeah, that, that would be a hard ball to grip. A, a fork ball can be a tough ball to grip. Obviously, not many guys throw a knuckleball, but that could be hard to grip, too. But, you know, you got to be a guy that fiddles. Here's Shaw chasing the ball that's over his head. Stein sniffing extra bases. He goes into second standing up. And it's a one-out double for Troy Stein. And what I mean by fiddle with the ball in your glove, I mean, you got to be a guy when you start to come up in the stretch position, as you see Stein right there, gets a ball. One of the few balls kind of up a little bit in the zone that Thornhill has made. One of the few pitches and mistakes that he's made. And really one of the first few balls that's hit hard by Texas A&M tonight, or so far today, rather. So now Thornhill... From the stretch of the man in scoring position and Logan Taylor to the plate. Ryan Dempster is a guy who mm -hmm. really fiddles. He flaps his glove around on you the mound. You got to. When you start to come up like he is in that position, you got to be moving your hands on all the pitches, fastballs, whatever you're throwing. You got to always move them because obviously when you're younger and nobody tells you that, when you go to grip an unusual pitch, you're going to give it away. The hitters can start to see that. So you got to start to fiddle a little bit on whatever pitch you throw. Logan Taylor 0 for 1 with a ground out first and a walk. Breaking ball, a little flare foul. The 7 to 1 Texas lead. And Nathan Thornhill has had success with a fastball that he has commanded for strikes today. And uh, a changeup that came in as a plus pitch that, I frankly, just the threat of the changeup has been good enough to keep these A&M hitters off balance. Yeah, and I really think A&M have kind of just outthought themselves a little bit on, on looking for it too much, you know, and, and not really looking for fastball and adjusting from there. swing and he didn't go according to the first base umpire Joe Mate. Yeah, Frank Sylvester is our home play guy. He's had a tremendous game behind the plate today by the way. Yeah been real consistent back there. You know he's given the ball at the knees. He's given a few balls off you know the corners by a couple of inches but I mean that's pretty common in today's college baseball. You don't get that a whole lot in pro ball 
But in college baseball, again, if the catcher rocks towards the outside or inside corner and you can hit the glove, even if it's a couple inches off the corners, you have a chance of getting that call. 100th pitch of the game is a strikeout of Logan Taylor. So we're talking about how a pitcher adjusts the grip once yeah. it's in his glove. Right. I mean, you got to fit it. When you come up in the stretch position, you'll see a lot of movement. You can see it from the back. You know, I may have any grip in my hand, but it, as I come up in my stretch position, I can quickly go to a two seam, a four seam, a change up. But I'm always feeling a breaking ball if I got to get that grip. But it's constant movement as I come up in the stretch. I'm always moving around, and nobody really knows what grip I have when I actually come set and get ready to pitch. But you got to be consistent with it. Here's Statham looks at the first pitch. What um, what grip did you start with? I didn't start with a grip because I wanted to always fiddle. You know, because if you if you start with a grip in your hand, say the, what we call a setter. You know, we set a two seam grip behind my back. When I come up and they never see any movement at all, they know the two seam fastball is coming. So I just started with a generic threw the ball, kept the ball in my hand, whatever grip, and I was always moving it around. So nobody knew when I came up what I was going to at that point. You don't want to be a setter to say, you know, and you see some guys will start, if they throw a splitter, they'll start with a splitter grip behind the back and they'll come up, but they'll fiddle on that too. They'll fiddle and not even change the grip and then they'll fiddle and go to a different pitch if they have to. Popped him up, left side. Johnson puts it away. Nice, easy six as Thornhill works around a double. Bottom part of the Texas lineup due up in the sixth. Eckling Park and the sights around it, one of the best atmospheres for college baseball and certainly helps to have three in-state teams here over the course of the weekend. Texas and Texas A&M start us off. The Longhorn faithful happy about this beginning. It's a 7-1 lead. Yeah, I got a little shade. The wind's blowing, picking up a little bit. I hope that doesn't mean we're getting some bad weather coming in. But right now, it's actually pretty comfortable with the overcast skies and the wind blowing. Patrick McClendon is the new second baseman for Texas A&M. And so Blake Alamon moves over to short. He, I, I wonder if Logan Taylor, mm -hmm. you know, two things about it. He's, he's made a couple of errors today. As the first pitch curveball misses to Hinojosa. And it could be a couple of things. Either he could still not be right physically, or Rob Childers could just say, listen, it's a 7-1 game. I need this guy to be healthy. I need to protect him. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's both of them. I mean, obviously, he hasn't played in a while. You know, and no need to have a guy in the game. I mean, not saying they're giving up because they're not giving up. Replacements are quite capable of coming back and you know, and put doing some good things. So it's just one of those deals where, hey, score seven to one. You know, got you in the ball game, played a little more than half the game. Let's get you out, let you recover a little bit. And because uh, I'm sure, I mean, he's back playing, but that certainly doesn't mean he's 100% by any stretch. Hinojosa lifts this one to left field. Bratson drifts and makes a catch. We talked with Rob Childress before the game. I said, you know, is he good to go? Are there any limitations? especially defensively for Logan Taylor. You would think that it's, where the lateral movement is so important at shortstop. That there's got to be something. He said, no, he said, I wouldn't play him if there were any limitations going into this game. He said, that's what the last few days have been about. They finished their SEC tournament one and done last Tuesday. So they've had plenty of time back in College Station to try out Logan Taylor to get him some reps and see where he stands physically. Yeah, I mean, lateral movement appeared to be fine. I mean, he's moving around well. I mean, the only thing is, and it's just reps, you know, just throwing the ball across the diamond. And you don't lose a whole lot with your arm in two or three weeks, but you do lose a little bit. And, you know, just like hitters like to take a couple of hundred swings a day, fielders like to catch, you know, 50, 100 ground balls a day and make 20, 30 throws a day over there. When you can't do that, like a pitcher, you don't expect to have the command you would normally have if you miss your bullpen workouts in between starts. It's just tough. Texas A&M chose not to work out at Reckling Park yesterday here at Rice. As Shaw looks at strike three, right down the heart of the plate, fourth K for Matt Kent in relief. Instead, they went ahead and worked out at home and made the short drive down. A couple hours through the beautiful Texas countryside before they hit the outskirts of Houston. Well, I tell you, I did a game over at Bluebell Park 
beautiful, isn't it? Boy, you know, since I was eight, 1989, I was last there, but boy, has things changed at Texas A&M since 1989. What a beautiful, beautiful ballpark. And you can see Kyle Field in the background, you know, the football stadium back there, and they're doing additions to that thing. It'll be well over 100,000 seating capacity there once they're done with the, uh, you know, the expansion. Now, Rob Childers was telling me that w when you were in College Station early this season for a game, you just missed their 1989 reunion by a day. Yes, I mean, what, what, that's eerie because I hadn't been back there since 89. And of course, they were honoring the, the Tex Texas A&M 89 club, which by all accounts was the best team that Texas A&M ever put on the field. You they know what I mean? 58 and 5. Yeah, they were 58 and 3. When you all came to town. When we, when we played them, yeah. And we beat them twice in the same day to go to Omaha. And that was like winning the College World Series, you know, at, the, at that time. I mean, they just had a club that was averaging... I mean, they were averaging 11 runs a game that year, you know. And I tell you what the what the what the uh, poll people thought of them. We beat them in the regionals to go to Omaha. At the end of the year, once Omaha was finished and the College World Series was over, they still ranked Texas A&M number two in the country, only behind the team that won the national championship. That's what they thought of Texas A&M that year. Chuck Knobloch was a first-round draft pick after mm -hmm. he lost two games to LSU. Clemens is 0 for 3 after another ground out to first. It's a 1-2-3 frame by Kent. 7-1 points. Breakfast just got back. Texas leads 3 seed Texas A&M 7-1 in the 7th. We're talking about this fine A&M program. 113th season of baseball at Texas A&M. They first started in 1894. Five times they've been to the College World Series. Last time in 11. They won 17 conference titles in the Old Southwest Conference. Six times in the Big 12. Chuck Knobloch, we just mentioned, was a first-round draft pick in 1989. Davey Johnson, then known as Dave Johnson, was drafted after the 1962 season. And Michael Walker, wow, what a start he's had at the major league level. Nearly threw a no-hitter last year as a rookie for the St. Louis Cardinals. That 1989 team, we went back, it was actually, they had five regular season losses. Then you guys, uh, your LSU team went in, swept them in two games to go to Omaha and when you went back to Bluebell Park it seems some of those Aggie faithful haven't forgotten you no no I mean I mean and you got to remember that was before they had regionals and super regionals that's when they took you know five different regionals around the country eight teams went to it's only 40 42 teams that actually you know made it into it but I got off the airplane and uh, a guy recognized me in the airport says you know we still don't like you and LSU <laughs> here so that's how my uh, my week weekend started at A&M and then I'm over there talking to Childress way before the guy a game and there's a, an older gentleman you know behind the third base dugout he's got a cane in his hand and as soon as I walk up and I start talking to coach Childress he shakes his cane at me and goes I saw enough of you 25 years ago McDonald what are you doing back here you know so I was a little bit concerned you know, going back to A&M. Uh, C.J. Hinojosa handles Cray Bratton. It's a 6-3 ground out. And that'll bring Blake, Blake Alamon to the plate. He is one for three. Alamon at the top of the lineup. I always like to talk to Major League pitchers about their college days. Tim Hudson was a favorite as mm -hmm. an SEC Player of the Year, as an outfielder and a yeah, pitcher. Two way went player. to Omaha. As like Mike Miners on that tremendous Vandy team in rotation with David Price and Ryan Flaherty in the infield and Pedro Alvarez at third. I was almost a two-way player in that series against the NM that we were talking about. I, I pitched the first seven against them, and Coach Burton put me out in left field because we had a pretty good lead in case I had to come back in the game and A&M made a little bit of a rally. So I'm out in left field, caught a, caught a ball out there or two. And, but I was actually on deck to get to hit in the top of the ninth when we made the final out, so I didn't get a chance to bat, and that was disappointing for me. So I was almost a two-way player for a day. You know, one thing that's, that is always fun in a, in a big league clubhouse, and you hear about it more once college football season rolls around, obviously in September, but the school pride that a lot of pro players still have going back to their college days was that ever a topic of conversation for you in the big leagues with the Orioles and Brewers absolutely I mean you know when you go to a university and you that's where you grow up and you become a young man 
Uh, there's always a lot of pride, especially coming to a program that's, that's got a good baseball program. Shaw catches up to this one for out number two off the bat of Alamo. Off the bat of Alamo. Two down. And so, yeah, it was always a little bit of back and forth, you know, and I was always tuned in because, you know, it was about the time I left LSU. We never won one when I was there. Went to the World Series two of my three years, but it kind of all started in 91 for LSU, and they won, you know, five national titles in the span of, of nine years. And so I was playing big league ball all during that time, so I'm always giving, giving the boys a little bit, you know, the, the guys that went to other universities, giving them a hard time. Here's Ryan Burke. He is one for two. And that whole time, you got international, you know, players, Latin American players, kids who sign out of high school, they have no idea what they miss. Oh, I agree. You know, I say this all the time. I would never advise a kid to go away from college. I mean, if you're a college guy and college is for you, I just think it's the place to be, you know. And, and uh, you know, unless you're a first-round draft pick, if you're a first-round draft pick and they throw a lot of money at you, $2 million, I mean, it's hard for me to tell you not to do that because you can always go back to school. But other than that, I think college is the way to go. You know, it gives you an opportunity to grow up. More important than that, you're starting to work on your education because the truth of the matter is very few guys actually make a living playing baseball at the end of the day. Very, very few guys play in the big leagues. You can't make enough money playing minor league ball. And so you got to make it to the big leagues, and you got to stay there for a while. And it's hard to do that. And so I always advise kids to go to college, especially, you know, when you go into programs. Because, I mean, let's face it, when you're seeing this kind of competition or SEC-type baseball, I mean, you're talking about the level of double-A baseball, in my opinion, you know, especially the way the bats are right now. Because, listen, when Aaron Nola's running out there, you know, on Friday nights and you're facing him as a hitter, I mean, he's as good as there is. I and mean, you see that in some of the other pitchers, Ellis at Ole Miss and around the country, Logan Shore in Florida, you know, and you got some other guys around, you know, Rodon, NC State. I mean, it's, it's some really, really quality arms out there. In the center field where Peyton waits. And it's a one, two, three frame work by Thornhill. He's got a career high in strikeouts. He is cruising through seven. We step into the stretch in Houston with the Longhorns up by six. If they make but Texas took control in the third inning with a four run frame, blowing open a two run contest. And that's all the scoring we've seen today. The seven to one lead for the Longhorns. And the first pitch is double take line out to first base off to the bat of Zane Gerwitz one down back to the top of the order Brooks Marlowe Marlowe looks at the first offering low Marlowe got the game started with a solo home run yeah, he just set the tone. First batter of the game, 3-2 count. Got a fastball from England and just buried it out in the trees. And that really set the tone. And here we are here in the bottom of the seventh. Longhorns with eight base hits. That time for your pick-you-up moment of the game. Brought to you by Enterprise Rent-A-Car. This was it. Marlowe to start the game. Longhorns 18-2 and two when they score first. And that was a great start, and the defense has been fantastic. A 12 diving stop by Marlowe at second. He's been all over the place for the Longhorns. Foul of first base. It's been almost what we talked about. I mean, pitching and defense has been outstanding for Texas. More than expecting seven runs in the first three innings against Texas A&M, but I tell you what. I guess that's the biggest surprise to me. Not yet. Yeah. A lot of people will be surprised that they scored seven, but that it came in a burst in the first three. Right. I'm, that, you know, pitching Thornhill has been as good as advertised. First time I've seen him this year, and he's, I mean, I'm really impressed. Uh, you know, not so much with his velocity, but we knew that about him coming in. But, we, you know, he just spots that fastball on both sides of play. He's not been the changeup guy that a lot of people thought. And the scouting report was on him that that's his best pitch. Well, his fastball's been his best pitch today. And it should be every pitcher's best pitch because the fastball is what sets up everything else that you may have and he's been that guy down in the zone knee high staying out of the middle of the plate on the corners and moving the ball around he's been really really impressive today on the other hand Daniel Mangan could not find his fastball location he'd lasted just two and a third innings allowed seven runs the only good news is after 52 pitches maybe if AM's still in this thing late in the week Sunday or Monday they could bring him back 
Yeah. It was a career high in runs allowed by Mangdon this season. Or, uh, pardon me, today. Curveball has popped out of play. Matt Kent came on to help him out in the third inning, allowed an inherited runner to score, and since then he shut him down. Mm -hmm. He's been tremendous as he reaches the 50 pitch mark. Only one hit allowed by Kent, and that was to the first batter he faced. Little tapper back to the mound. Kent takes care of Marlowe. In other action today, LSU was trailing southeastern Louisiana 4 to 2 in the seventh inning. A couple of singles in the seventh to tie it, then blew it open in the eighth. They scored four unearned runs and an 8 to 4 win in game one in Baton Rouge. More than 11,000 on hand at the box, and LSU can bounce back with one of the best, if not the best, pitcher in the country when Nola goes for game two play the winner of Houston and Bryant. Here's Ben Johnson to the right side. McClendon, the new second baseman, beats Johnson by a step and a half. It's a one, two, three frame work by Ken. He has been fantastic. We head to the eighth, seven to one, Texas. The women's cup. Welcome back to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. Gorgeous campus here at Rice University. I host the regional once again, and Texas leads Texas A&M 7-1. Fantastic crowd on hand. In fact, it is a record crowd here today. 6,603, largest in the history of Reckling Park, breaking the previous mark that was set for the Rice-Texas game back in March of 2009. Previous record for an NCAA regional when Lamar met Texas A&M in a winner's bracket game. And the largest previous postseason crowd was a 2008 Super Regional Rice in Texas A&M through 5,368. The Aggies have played in front of five of the top ten crowds in Reckling Park history. Well, I can say this first time I've been to Reckling Park here you like at Rice. It? I tell you what, impressive place. I wonder. Um, I wonder as this weekend continues, as Morgan Cooper enters the game for Texas, 26th appearance, he's 4-2, a big right-hander, comes home with a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. I wonder if we get to Sunday in the championship game of this regional, whether it's Rice or these two teams playing, we might have a chance to break that record today. Into center field, off the bat of Cole Lankford, Peyton still drifting back, one down. Well, I tell you, you got to be impressed with Texas. I mean, it's always what we talked about. They weren't real good at it, swinging the bats. They're doing that so far. We knew the pitching and defense, and Thornhill was as good as anybody I've seen this year at commanding the strike zone. Sets a career high in strikeouts against a very good hitting team in Texas A&M. So certainly advantage for Texas, but don't forget about Rice. Rice is really good. Nick Banks is 0 for 3 today. Pulled the string out of nothing and one. Nathan Thornhill, you mentioned career high in strikeouts. He caged seven over seven innings, a run on six hits. Back to the fastball, nothing and two. Pitch. Two, two strikes, 0 2 again. See Barrera rock to the outside corner and Cooper right to the glove just off the outside. Cooper's a six foot five inch freshman and he comes back with another 90 mile an hour fastball and strikes out Banks. Yeah, just a freshman. You got to like the frame. Tall, lean, kid that's going to develop, mature. You could be really. Cooper could be a guy a couple of years from now, you know, that's, that's constantly pitching 94, 95. He could be that kind of guy. Cooper, freshman out of Gerald, Texas, his first curveball misses away to Logan Nottebrook.
Is it his frame that suggests to you and, and the velocity he already has as a freshman that he could add a few uh, miles an hour to that fastball? I think so. I mean, you talk about an 18, 19 year old kid and it's going to get stronger and bigger. He's not real, real slim, but he's going to fill out and he's going to get stronger. I remember I picked up about eight miles an hour in between my freshman and sophomore years, you know, and, and uh, well, I should say, going into my freshman year, I picked up a bunch of them. Boy, he can back that up above 90 type fastball. You back it up with a hammer like this. I mean, that's a real 12 to 6 or right there. So, I mean, you can see this guy being in the rotation, you know, next year. Late on 92, back to back strikeouts for Morgan Cooper. It is all orange today. Texas in control as we go to the bottom of the eighth. It's 20. The NCAA Baseball Regionals is presented by the Quicksilver Card from Capital One. Earn 1.5% cash back on every purchase. And in part by Joseph A. Bank. We fit most everyone. JOSBank.com. And USAA. Proudly serving the financial needs of current and former military members and their families. Part of the Texas lineup do up to start the home half of the eighth inning in the two seed Longhorns with a seven to one lead. Peyton followed by Tres Barrera and then Madison Carter. And Peyton pulls one foul. One of the most remarkable streaks alive for Mark Peyton thanks to his first inning single. He has now reached base safely in 96 consecutive games. That's that's just hard to believe to be that consistent for that long. Last year, Peyton led the Big 12 with a 393 average, came in to this postseason hitting 319. That on base streak is a Big 12 record, also sixth in the nation this year, 48 walks to his name. Curveball, a little tapper, back to the mound, and Kent, great job fielding his position, one down. Yeah, Kent's been really good. You, know, you go back to that, that record on Mark Peyton, though, you're talking about. You know, Big 12 conference ranked the second best conference in the country this year, you know, and he, he put up some good numbers in that kind of, in that conference for sure. Here's Barrera, who is one for three. We were talking about that off air today, and you know, the Big 12, in terms of the strength of that league, without a doubt, is at the top of the league. Oh, yeah. TCU. TCU is as good as best. anybody. I'm telling you, I mean, they're a team that's built to win Omaha with the pitching that they have, the way they steal bases, the defense. I mean, you got to like TCU a lot, especially if they can make it to Omaha because that ballpark will benefit the way they play. Remember, a team that's only got 12 homers, TCU on the year. So it's not the long ball. It's the pitching, the defense, and enough offense to win it. Oklahoma State mm -hmm. is hosting. But, then I, you know, I keep coming back to... Uh, to what the SEC has accomplished this season as Barrera gets his second hit of the game. And if you want to compare the top of the Big 12, Oklahoma State won the conference with 18 league wins, then TCU, Kansas, Kansas finished two games above Texas. Mm -hmm. and you compare the bottom of the Big 12 to the bottom of the SEC. Right. The guys who didn't make the postseason from the SEC, Tennessee, Georgia, Missouri, and Auburn, just four teams. They, they put ten in. Yeah. And talking with Rob Childers before the game, he said, listen, there's no breather over the course of an SEC season. Mm -hmm. He said, even, even in the Big 12, after Nebraska had left and gone to the Big 10, you may have an off weekend where you literally get a breather with a non-conference opponent. Or a subpar team comes in and you know, hey, we can breathe a little easier that's just not the case in the SEC that's right I mean and I think the Big 12 is as deep you know when you talk about the first four or five teams in each league I think it's pretty doggone equal it really is but to your point I think it's what what separates the SEC from the rest is it's deep throughout you know it's constant all the way through a 30 game schedule you know whereas most other conferences have a lot of good good teams up front but the bottom really falls off and that's not to say that Texas isn't a better team than Texas A&M. They have been better from the get-go today. Oh, yeah. There is no doubt. And, and to tell you how tough the Big 12 is, Texas finishes fifth in that conference. 0-2 to Carter is a fastball away. 
Longhorns lead this game 7-1. to one. That was the score after three innings. And efficient work since then by Matt Kent out of the Texas A&M bullpen. Here comes a 60-second pitch from Kent. You know, it's a couple of issues for Texas A&M as you pay it forward and their opportunity to advance out of this regional after, if this score holds and after trailing so big is, is you may have lost two pitchers today for the entire weekend. Yeah, yeah I think it's a, it's a good possibility. I think it looks like Kent's in for the long haul here. You know, he'll, he'll finish this one up and, and so his pitch count's gotten you know, well above 60, and then Mingling, you just don't know, you know, with his injuries and, you know, the problems he's had, you just wonder if they'll try and bring him back. But, again, it is postseason, and, you know, he might be a guy if they can hang around till, you know, Sunday or Monday that you can run out there, not to start a ball game, but I'm talking about a guy you could bring in to maybe suck up an inning or two for you if you needed to in a pinch. You know, I don't think he's in, I think he's done as far as starting goes for this series or this, this tournament regional, but, eh, you know, maybe at the end he can come in and close the game. Well, the difference has been astounding. Texas hitters against Mingdon went 7 for 12, all seven scores against the A&M starter. Against Kent, just 2 for 16. To the left side, that one tied up, not a brook. Everybody safe. Wait and see if that's a hit or an error, but regardless, Texas has two on here in the eighth with only one out. Well, it was certainly barreled up. It was hit hard. I don't know what they're going to call it. It was hit right at Nottebrook, but, I mean, it's, de it's deceiving a lot of times. I mean, you get a lot of balls that knuckle off the bat, and they're hooking down there at the hot corner, and that was certainly a hot shot for Nottebrook. Second hit of the inning for Texas, tenth of the game. And here's C.J. Hinojosa. He is two for three today. Folks, a surprise of Texas today. Seven runs on ten hits for a team which was averaging fewer than five runs a game coming into the postseason. They scored ten in a ten-nothing win at Kansas State in their final Big 12 series of the season. That was a Kansas State team which finished dead last in the Big 12. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it. Both of these clubs coming into regional play hadn't exactly been burning it up. I mean, there was concern for Texas. I mean, they'd lost three of their last four series. They go two and two in the Big 12 tournament. For A&M, you know, they were five and five their last ten games, and they lost their only game in the SEC tournament. So really two teams that, you know, weren't playing that well coming in. Wayne Graham and his Rice Owls sitting back Watching this game today, must be thinking, where did this Texas team come from? Hinojosa with two on. Good looking fastball. Ran inside and just missed the plate. You're right, that was a good pitch. But that's been the difference between Kent and Mingdon. Kent's kept them all speed, all off balance a little bit, throwing some off speed pitches, but stayed out of the middle of the plate. I mean, it's been down at the knees. It's been on the corners. It's been changing speeds. See that pitch gets it on the hands of Hinojosa. Stein runs out of room. Still to come in the nightcap. Rice making its 20th consecutive appearance in the NCAA tournament. Fourth longest active streak and hosting for the 11th time in the last 14 years. Rice and George Mason. We've seen four seeds make it to Omaha. We've seen four seeds win it all. Can Mason have a Cinderella run like their basketball team did? Bratson trying to chase this one down. Shallow right. A lot of ground covered by Craig Bratson. Some Rob Childress talked to us about it. He said, when he used to go to Texas A&M as a pitching coach in Nebraska, he first noticed that there was seemingly more acreage well let's face it the entire campus has a ton of acreage but more acreage at Bluebell Park and College Station for outfielders to cover than he thinks he's ever seen he said I don't know what it is it's just line to line you got to have a you can't stick a big dummy out in the corners you can't stick oh, a yeah. big 
power hitting guy who can't move. You have to have three outfielders who can really float, and Bradson certainly fits that bill. Line drive off the bat of Shaw. Barrera being waved home. Here's the throw from Banks. It is up the line, and he is safe. He went around the tag with a head first dive. And Childress out of the dugout quickly to argue. Stein thought he had the tag on Barrera. Instead, it's the ninth run of the game for Texas. Well, pretty good throw by Banks in the outfield. That ball comes in on one hop to the catcher, Stein. And we hadn't got a shot of it just yet, but Stein adamant about the fact he thinks that he made the tag. Here's a good throw in by Banks, one hop. Kind of up the line. Let's take a look at it. Glove goes down. Oh. They have got him right on the seat. Yeah, right on the rear end. Look, look like to me. I mean, it's hard to tell. Here it is again. Glove goes down. Oh, I tell you. This will be the view. Looks like there's some contact to me. I don't see any space there. If this were Major League Baseball, they'd be watching this replay back in New York City, but the college game replay review not involved. And what's been a frustrating afternoon for Texas A&M. Even made more so. And I think he definitely got it. You could tell that the swipe tag was interrupted. His momentum as he was mm -hmm. swiping slowed down yeah, like he slowed hit. when he hit him that's in the right. rump. Here it is again. And that's a tough call to make, but you're right. I think right there. And of course, Coach Childers had the best view of him as he had the perfect angle for it. At the major league level, they may still refer to that as inconclusive. Well, regardless, Casey Clemens at the plate now. The Rockets' son looking for his first hit of the game. Casey Twice is grounded out to first, and he is struck out. Eight runs on 11 hits for this Texas offense. Kent misses inside again. One thing Texas A&M really wants to have happen before this game comes to conclusion is they got to get Matt Kent to find this third out. They don't want to have to go back to the bullpen. They had Chester up moments ago. Two pitchers will be plenty for A&M. Yeah, that might be the only good news from here, you know, for A&M, if they can get out of this with just using up only two pitchers. Normally when you give up eight runs on 11 hits, it's normally two or three or sometimes four pitchers to stop those kind of numbers from going up. But Lord Kent has been really good since coming in for Mingdon. To first, and Clemens is going to go 0 for 4 with three ground outs to Lankford. Well, the Aggies finally had something to get loud about. In fact, it was still a Texas call. Eight to one Longhorns. If Coming up on ESPNU, Brian Anderson and Arkansas take on the Flame Train of Liberty, a team playing very, very well. We'll get you to Charlottesville coming up at the top of the hour for that one. Seen that flame train in action on the road here, number two, Texas, away from home, has found its offense and also great pitching today from their starter, Nathan Thornhill. Eight runs and 11 hits for the Longhorns. Last chance for Texas A&M. Troy Stein doubled his last time up. And a 90 mile an hour fastball from Morgan Cooper. Miss low. 378th meeting on the diamond between Texas and Texas A&M. Longtime rivals reunited by the NCAA selection committee. Did a fantastic job this season. Although, there may be some folks sitting at home looking at Texas A&M as one of the last four in and seeing their lack of production and their mm -hmm. poor starting pitching today saying we could have fared better. Absolutely. Hasn't been a good performance 
any way you slice it for A&M. I mean, only one run, six hits. Defensively, they haven't been that good. Only three errors. So that'll be another base hit. And Ahoso just couldn't get his glove on it. And yeah. Troy Stein is two for four. Take a look at today's Capital One player of the game, Nathan Thornhill. Yeah, but when you run up against a guy like this, you don't get a lot of hits. All I heard was about the changeup. You know, scouting report, there's one changeup. That's a fastball. The first strikeout was a fastball. That's another fastball. What do you know? Another fastball. And to finish it up, I got another fastball for you. And how about one more? So the scouting report was not right. I mean, six out of seven, that ties his career high with seven strikeouts. But it was the fastball for me all day long is what dominated Texas A&M. And, you know, I don't know if A&M was kind of looking at the same report that I heard. He's going to throw a lot of changeups. He didn't do that. He, I mean, 88 to 91 miles an hour is what he was. But, boy, did he pitch today with that fastball. It looked like Roger Clemens out there throwing so many fastballs. Have you seen Roger Clemens out there today? He might be here. I, I have not seen him. I'm sure he is probably here somewhere. First at bat for Patrick McClendon. Chopper off the pitcher's glove. Chance for Hinojosa. Grabs. Guns. Got him. Oh, what a play by Hinojosa. He had a battle with his second baseman, Marlowe. He took the ball away from Marlowe, and he turned the double play on his own. How about this? Well, one off the glove, one hop, right to the shortstop, Hinojosa, and back over. And when it's going good, it's going good, and Texas has played well. When you play well, lots of times you get breaks, too, and that's certainly catching a break right there. 61st double play by Texas this year. We talked about the defense. That's 10th best in the country. And I'm going to tell you, nine times out of ten, you can look at the scoreboard at the end of the day in college baseball. It's always been that way at any level. And the team that makes the most errors is a team that normally loses. That's just the way it is. Texas A&M has been flawless on defense, outstanding pitching. And what's been the most surprising thing to me is a steady offense has pounded out 11 hits and eight runs. Two of those three errors from A&M came in the first two innings when Texas built its lead. Longhorns sent seven to the plate in the third and scored four runs in that deciding frame. I mean, how good is your pitching from Texas if this is the guy you bring in to mop up with a six or seven run lead and he's throwing 90-91 with a nasty breaking ball on top of it. There's 92. Skip Johnson told some national media when they, skied, uh, when they signed Morgan Cooper that they got a steal. Certainly looks like it, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to like him. And good live arm. And like I said, he could be a guy, you know, a, a high pick here in a couple of years. A guy that could be pushing 94, 95 pretty regular. Trying to find that fastball location. The count has gone full to Jace Statham. Ace is empty, two down. A&M held a one run on seven hits. Into the left center. Peyton and Johnson converge. It's a center fielder who calls for it and wins the 378th meeting against their rivals from Aggieland, taking the series lead 241 to 132 with five ties. And this one and the NCAA postseason will put Texas in the winner's bracket. They await the winner of Rice and George Mason. Meanwhile, Texas A&M will face an elimination game to get us started tomorrow, 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Central. A&M awaits the loser of the nightcap tonight. Remember, that game is just an hour and 10 minutes away here from Houston. It can be found on ESPN3 as one seed Rice gets its postseason started against four seed and upset-minded George Mason. Texas with an 8-1 to one victory. Their offense explodes. They nearly doubled their season average in runs. They pound out 11 hits. It is a new brand of baseball away from the dish for Texas. They come on the road, neutral site games. Doesn't matter. When they're outside of Austin, the offense comes alive. Once again, our final score, Texas 8, Texas A&M 1. Coming up next, it's bases loaded. Gets you around the country. All the regional action getting started today and what should be a fun NCAA turn. We return at 8 o'clock Eastern on ESPN3 as Rice takes on George Mason. So long for now from Houston.
Coming up next on ESPNU, Chris Oliver and Arkansas take on Liberty. That game top of the hour as we welcome you in. Two bases loaded, where we're with you all the way through Monday. Dory Noka, Mike Rooney, Kyle Peterson. Guys, uh, those who were watching on ESPN, we've been checking in on bases loaded throughout the day. How do you describe, Runes, what we saw from Texas in an 8 1 win against AM today? You look at Texas, they've got the formula. That's tremendous starting pitching. There's depth in their pitching. They play the small game, and they were very offensive today, KP. So to me, Texas is a team that scares you. Started right away. I mean, your leadoff guy, Marlowe, goes deep, and I think it sets the tone for the entire ball game, and especially in a setting like that. It's where you know from an emotion standpoint, I mean, emotions are on high for everybody. And you know, Marlowe really takes the gas out of AM and, and their fans right into the ball game. You do that in that setting and then put a beating on them like they did, man, Texas Texas got a chance to be pretty scary. For those uh, that have been kind of watching this game and not really going around the